what I'm going to talk to you about is how plug-in hybrids can, can uh, uh, head us towards sustainability uh, without oil using renewable energy. And really the goal is to transition ourselves from we, where we are now with our gas stations, our, plug, our plugs in the house and so on, but to do it while we continue our lifestyle or even enhance our lifestyle. So what we're headed for is really much lower cost energy. Now some people say, when you do this, you're gonna to continue to uh, uh, have people uh, demand uh, more Hummers and so on. Well, that may be true. That's only now. What we have to do is to uh, start transitioning and uh, the transition is always difficult. So we want to transition from petroleum, coal, natural gas to completely renewable energy without a disruption in lifestyle. Okay, the problem with most renewable energy generators is lack of storage. So we heard the wind and solar stuff last, uh, last night and um, the trouble is all those are intermittent sources. In order to have that wind generator is on the off, it's offshore here, you've got to build a power plant to take care of the time when the wind's not blowing. Because, so what do you need? When the wind blows, you got to put the energy somewhere. Every electron generator must be used. If you don't use it, you will have to waste it. So wind needs storage. So how do you get that storage? You can either pump, high, pump water uphill or you can put it in electrochemical ba batteries. But we don't have batteries. How do you get batteries? And how do you get batteries with it? enough batteries around so you can store all that energy you're generating? One of the ways to do it is to use the batteries and plug in hybrids. And in a way, for society, it's free energy. Somebody paid for it, it's the guy who bought the car. Okay, whatever we do, we don't want to step back in technology. This is maybe sustainable, <laughs> but that's not what we want to do. Okay, a building block for sustainability then, I, I contend, is really the plug-in hybrid uh, with enough batteries to provide 30 to 60 miles of all electric range. So we can charge these batteries at night using the electric grid and daily charging with solar or wind and we can use the vehicle energy to power not only our transportation, but our home and offices and factories uh, and uh, air conditioning, et cetera. So daytime charging with renewable resources. So um, what energy infrastructure are we talking about? We have only two energy infrastructures in our society, uh, electricity coming out of wall plugs and uh, gasoline stations. So that's where we have to begin a transition. We, we cannot transition suddenly to another form of energy, hydrogen or something like that, because that's a step change, that won't happen. We have to transition from what we have. So uh, the plug-in hybrid allows us to do it. Uh, the, uh, the, the plugs we have, every garage has a, a plug and uh, people who live in apartment houses can use an extension cord and so on. Most important thing to realize is we have plenty of time to charge batteries in a plug-in hybrid because if you don't charge the plug-in hybrid, you've got gasoline. It's a dual energy system. The average person drives this car only three hours a day. What's that mean? That means for 21 hours a day, that car is sitting around someplace. So if you plug it in, you can use those batteries. Those batteries can supply your house while it's being parked or the factories or wherever you are, and the uh, batteries uh, can supply you transportation for the three hours that you're driving. So the purpose of plug-in hybrid is zero carbon energy uh, use in our society. We've heard all the doomsday talk today and uh, yesterday. <laughs> and we, and, but I started this work uh, some 30 years ago, and uh, I was talking into a vacuum for all the, many of those years. But we've created solutions now that need uh, but, but we need to bring these solutions, the plug-in hybrid, into mass production. So Bill Reinhardt and uh, Toyota is helping, I hope. And uh, batteries are, uh, and really, even though Bill still thinks the batteries are, are a problem, um, I've shown over and over again that uh, we could do it now 
and um, take a chance on the batteries maybe, but fundamentally these batteries in these cars have to be designed for 150,000 miles minimum and 15 years of life. We like to have 20 years of life and 200,000 miles. The battery technology is, it's there now. So what is a plug-in hybrid? A plug-in hybrid is like a, like a Toyota Prius, except it's a much smaller engine, but, but bigger electric motor and bigger batteries. I want to emphasize, this is a system. So when you increase the batteries, uh, you know there are a bunch of people taking a Prius and just adding batteries. That's not how you design a plug-in hybrid. You design a plug-in hybrid when you increase the batteries, you increase the electric motor along with the batteries, and you decrease the gasoline engine. I think uh, Professor Haywood just mentioned the objective is to go to a smaller engine because then you get the load up and you have much better fuel efficiency. This combination allows the vehicle to have much better fuel economy, higher performance, uh, and all electric range up to 60 miles. Well, what's this all electric range mean? We define all electric range as being uh, able to drive in the city up to 55, 50, or up to 60 miles an hour, all electrically. If you go over 60 miles an hour, you're no longer in the city, you're on the highway, then the engine comes on automatically, and then the, in the vehicle becomes a standard hybrid. So the key is we deplete the batteries in the plug-in hybrid from 100% state of charge, where you got that energy from the sun, to about 20% state of charge, and we, we, we maintain the state of charge at 20%, with the engine, but we never use the engine to charge the batteries. Why? It's much more efficient. It's not very efficient to take uh, mechanical energy, convert it to electricity, and back. It's better to maintain the batteries at 20%. When you get home, you plug it in and charge it back up with, with uh, electricity. Okay, well, all the car companies, essentially, including Toyota, have done this. They've uh, built a... Uh, a hybrid with a, with a downsized gasoline engine. I, I call it a large internal combustion engine. It's about smaller, uh, uh, smaller by about 20% more or less uh, in the Toyota Prius, and a relatively small electric motor. But when you go to a plug-in, you greatly increase the batteries, of course, to add the plug, but you greatly decrease the uh, engine size and increase the electric motor. And when you do this, you can decrease the engine size to about one-third the conventional vehicle. And when you, when, when you add all these things up together, you end up with a car that gets at least 100% improvement in fuel economy. Okay. Well, according to uh, Professor Haywood, that's only going from 1% to 2%. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's, we've doubled the fuel, we can double the fuel economy or half the fuel consumption. So advantages of a large battery pack is much more than just transportation. Uh, it provides zero emission capability for driving around, of course, low noise, but it doesn't have to be charged with, uh, uh, does not have to be charged since the uh, gasoline and diesel engine is always there. So uh, that was the whole business of maintaining at 20%. The net result is that the cost of going from point A to point B, that's a fuel cost, it's anywhere between one-tenth and one-third the cost of driving a regular car. Really, the consumer doesn't care about fuel economy. What he cares, uh, cares about is how much does it cost me to, to go from uh, home to work and do all my things. So the key here is to focus on the total cost. And the reason why it's lower is because the cost of electricity in these cars, and I've actually built these cars, is like buying gasoline at about 70 cents a gallon. So that's not too bad. Batteries can be used to store energy from small water. Water, I'm not talking about using water to drink or to, to process. I'm talking about water electric generation, uh, wind solar uh, systems as well. And when you use solar and wind, the cost actually comes down even further uh, from a conventional car uh, about 15 cents per mile to about two cents per mile. So is this possible? Well, here's uh, uh, some solar charging stations, three and a half kilowatt hours on the uh, upper left uh, to uh, uh, 30 kilowatt hours, but 
these provide shade. I think this, uh, our solar um, talk focus. Now, one of the things I want to mention about the solar systems is solar systems, when you uh, compare it to try, when you try to displace electricity at six cents or eight cents a kilowatt hour, doesn't, doesn't pan out very well uh, in terms of uh, um, replacement costs and so on. However, if you use solar energy to displace gasoline, that's a different commodity, which is worth four or five times more. And the payback period for solar comes down from about 30 years down to about six years, five years. What does that mean? A solar cell lasts for uh, 30 years. You, you uh, use it for, chart for uh, displacing gasoline. You get payback in five years. That means you get 25 years of free energy to drive your car. Now, can you beat that in gasoline price? Okay, so what about small solar versus large solar? You can put solar on your house or you can buy solar, you know, uh, we can have these massive solar uh, projects, et cetera, et cetera. The key is if you have solar on your house, you, the person who buys the car, can achieve energy independence. And that is where we can, um, uh, we can, you know, we talk about the value of uh, plug-in hybrids, and you know, I, you just heard from Toyota that, well, you know, people, uh, nobody's going to buy these cars because they're going to be higher in cost and so on. I'm going to add solar cells; it's going to make it even higher in cost. Okay, will people buy these? Well, they will when they can achieve energy independence. That means. Or as oil volatility uh, goes on in, uh, in the future, there may be gas lines and all that. If you had energy independence, if you offer a product that gave people energy independence, people will buy that. I think everybody in this room will. So that's the, the key to, to uh, driving the technology. Um, the, of course, the energy independence will give you emergency power for uh, all kinds of things. So, uh, wind, same thing. Uh, wind turbines, by the way, there's a lot of talk about using wind to uh, energy and convert it to hydrogen and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to talk to the bottom line. One of the things is if you use wind to charge plug-in hybrids, the plug-in hybrid will go three or four times farther than if you took that wind and converted it to hydrogen and ran a fuel cell. That doesn't mean that hydrogen shouldn't be worked on. It just means the bar is now raised by three or four hundred percent, not three or four. So three or four times means that fuel cell has to be three or four hundred percent better than a plug-in hybrid. That's okay. It, people should do that research, but we're spending way too much money on that now. Now uh, we saw some wind wind uh, pictures uh, last night. These are wind turbines off of uh, off of. Uh, the coast of Denmark, and that little red spot, that's a helicopter pad. So <laughs> the, the stuff we're talking here is nothing. <laughs> okay, large utility wind and solar can be plug-in hybrids, um, um, can use the plug-in hybrids a mass. One of the things when we talk about uh, big wind and big solar, like those big turbines that we just talked about, they generate in when the wind blows. That's a lot of energy that comes in into the grid. Well, when that energy comes into the grid, you've got to take your power plant, which is generating electricity on the grid, and shut them down. And so, what have, what have you done? You've actually made the grid less efficient and more costly because now you've got all this idle capital equipment sitting around. That's what the whole whole uh, protest we had here the other night. People didn't want those peaking, that peaking uh, oil plant uh, in their backyard. And that's what all that protest was all about. Because when you put the wind out there, you, you've got to have something to take care of the uh, electric supply when the wind isn't blowing. <laughs> so, but if you have plug-in hybrids already distributed in society, when the wind blows, you've got a place to put it. You've got all this battery distributed in your society. That's the whole point about the plug-in hybrid. It's much more than transportation because 
it now feeds into the overall picture of uh, energy use. Now, is it all practical? How can it be done? This is something we built um, in our, at the university. Uh, this little 660 cc gasoline engine displaces a three liter gasoline engine, uh, but to make the same performance, we've got a 100 horsepower electric motor hanging on be behind it and a continuously variable transmission, which is much better than what's on the market, by the way. Uh, this is a 300, con 300 horsepower continuous ver continuously variable transmission. This transmission has the same ratio range as a five speed, six speed Mercedes, uh, but it's only got 20 parts instead of 2,000 parts. So that's how you get the cost down. So the cost savings we, we get in the engine and the um, electric motors can go into batteries. And I contend that the overall vehicle can remain almost constant in cost. Where do you put the batteries? Uh, Toyota chose them to put them under the seat. In a, this is an SUV configuration. We can put them under the floor. Uh, these are vehicles we have constructed. Uh, this is our latest. The latest is a um, Chevrolet Equinox. Uh, this car will be weigh about the same as a, a conventional car. It uses lithium-ion batteries. It'll be charged essentially from the sun. Um, CO2 emissions. Uh, this compares a, a, a full-size SUV uh, on the conventional cars, full-size SUV down to a subcompact car. A full-size, mid-size uh, SUV, uh, full-size sedan, and the compact sedan. Uh, zero range is a Toyota Prius style. 20-mile um, uh, HEV20 is a 20-mile all-electric range uh, plug-in hybrid. HEV60 is a 60-mile range plug-in hybrid. By the way, I built these 60-mile range plug-in hybrids. Uh, they actually do exist. And uh, you see that the CO2 emissions, this is kind of have a cake, have your cake and eat it too. The CO2 emissions of the 60 mile range full size SUV makes less CO2 emissions than the compact standard car. But here's the most dramatic picture. And really this conference is all about um, gasoline displacement. This is the annual fuel consumption. You see, one of the problems with a plug-in hybrid is a dual fuel system. What we, we don't have any standards to compare. Fuel economy is not the right measure. It's how much gasoline you use or gasoline displacement. Here's, here's the annual gasoline consumption. Whoops. I, okay. Annual gasoline consumption for the same four vehicles on the left. And uh, again, the HEV Zero is the Toyota Prius. Uh, HEV 20, 20 mile, and here's a 60 mile electric range plug-in hybrids. Uh, and you notice the green dot is the full-size SUV. And the full-size SUV, in terms of gallons per year, it uses about one quarter of the gallons per year of uh, amount of fuel uh, that a, um, a compact sedan like a Ford Focus would use. This is this says we can't have our cake and eat it too. And our, obje our objective, what, that, what does that say? That says these plug-in hybrids with 60 miles of all-electric range use about 10% of the liquid fuel of a conventional car. What does that mean? That means we could transition to ethanol today because if you buy reformulated gasoline, it's already 10% ethanol. Well, more or less 10%, maybe 8%, but close. We could, if we built these, these kinds of cars, we could transition to an ethanol society and not affect our current ethanol supply because instead of blending it with gasoline, we just burn it directly in the car. There's an incremental cost. The um, question is, are people willing to pay? How much are they willing to pay? Um, the average, the Northeast, uh, Midwest, uh, South, and West, uh, people in the West are willing to pay a little more, but uh, the average is $9,300 a year. Uh, $9,300 for a new car that uh, has alternative fuel capability. This was a uh, survey at Washington, Washington Post just in uh, February, uh, March of this year, what, April of this year. So what we conclude, um, when people talk about alternative fuel, they're willing to pay for it. 
so there is a market. You know, uh, when you talk, when I talk to car companies, uh, not necessarily Toyota, but uh, Ford, GM, they're all focused on incremental costs. And uh, the, uh, the comment always comes back, nobody will pay, will, is willing to uh, pay anything extra for a car. Doesn't matter what's in it. Well, here, um, at least according to this survey, uh, people are willing to pay for alternative costs. And if you pay for that, you get all these other additional benefits of balancing the uh, electric system, et cetera. Now, uh, I did a, 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 a talk for Congress, and uh, they asked, okay, uh, how, how many of these cars do we need to get, uh, to get ourselves out of uh, Iraq, fundamentally? They didn't say it that way, but that's, that's the answer I gave them. <laughs> but roughly, um, Annual oil savings for 10% of the fleet, if 10% of the fleet were 40 mile range, all, all electric range hybrids, uh, you could save four and a half percent. What this curve shows is the amount of fuel saved depending upon the all electric range. So uh, the average vehicle uses 720 gallons a year and uh, you could save 600 gallons a year that is uh, the, uh, I showed you in the previous slide, that um, um, the fuel use can go down to 120 gallons a year. Um, anyway, a 40 mile all electric range will um, um, save you uh, four and a half percent, if 10% of the fleet were 40 mile all electric range, uh, plug-in hybrids, uh, you could uh, get out of uh, Iraq we'd say four and a half percent of the annual consumption and get us uh, out of Iraq. Now, what about the grid? A lot of people say, well, you know, you're gonna burn more coal, you're gonna, um, and um, so, and we will have to build more power plants because we're gonna have to charge these batteries, blah, blah. Uh, well, the grid has tremendous excess capacity. How much tremendous? Uh, here is a picture. If 20% if of the fleet were plug-in hybrids. And by the way, how long would it take us to go get to 20% of the fleet to be plug-in hybrids? At best, we replace 10% of the cars per year. At best, we could sell 10% of new cars per year. What's that mean? That means, at best, plug-in hybrids would be introduced in society at 1% a year. 20% about 20 years. So we got plenty of time to transition to solar and wind. We, so 20 years, we, could, we can do that. So 20% will only fill up half the, half the um, trough. Uh, between nighttime, the middle of the night is four, four, three or four o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, 14, 15 hours, uh, that's what's at, three or four o'clock in the afternoon is the peak. And so all the plants, all the uh, electric plants that are, are um, um, needed to generate the peak, uh, <laughs> two-thirds of those plants, I mean, one-third of those plants are shut down um, for a substantial portion of the day, like 18 hours. They're only used to do peaking. And that's why electricity in the peak of the day costs so much, because those plants sit around most of the day. Now that capital cost is just sitting there. And when somebody over here turns on the switch or you plug, you turn on your air conditioner, that plant has to come online because we have no storage. So the plug-in hybrid uh, could take that energy at, at night and that little white part feed it back during the day and your peaking uh, bar, the, the peaking plants go from the red bars over on the uh, left-hand side to the little red bars on the right hand. In other words, you'd reduce the number of peaking plants by probably a factor of three or four. And what would that translate to? Cheaper electric energy for everyone. So plug-in hybrids is a low-cost solution to environmental and energy uh, security problems and could provide high profits and employment for early investors. These vehicles can be brought to production now with little investment and development, no change in manufacturing uh, fuel infrastructure. This is the key. We can begin where we are without a change in uh, energy infrastructure. 
And plug-in hybrids can uh, begin the integration of society's energy systems to move towards a renewable uh, electric society by reducing petroleum consumption uh, first by 50% and to 100%. Remember, the focus is on fuel consumption reduction or oil consumption reduction and not fuel economy. That's a distinct difference. When you go to 100% uh, oil, uh, fuel reduction, petroleum reduction, what does that mean in terms of fuel economy? If fuel economy went to infinity, infinity is not well defined. Okay, so we can't, this can be an interim solution for the next 50 years. Pulling in hybrids can get, out of, get us out of Iraq and can use water power and other renewable energy. And uh, plug in hybrids will allow us to integrate our uh, transportation and stationary energy system for much higher overall efficiency and thus re drastically reducing our per capita energy consumption. So the goal is to reduce our per person consumption of fossil energy and oil, uh, of oil and coal uh, while improving our lifestyle uh, with greater comfort and productivity. Okay.